Hi, folks. Thanks for coming in today. Uh, welcome to the Insourcing American Jobs Forum here at the White House. We really appreciate everybody's patience as we uh, reconvened here from uh, the opening remarks provided by the President over in the East Room. Uh, we've got a great lineup. We've got uh, two panels today um, uh, full of both uh, uh, business leaders and elected officials talking about their experiences uh, doing uh, exactly that, uh, insourcing American jobs, bringing jobs back to this country, and increasing their investments uh, here in the U.S., uh, and how to try to make sure we set the conditions, uh, appropriate conditions in order to be able to encourage that um, across the board as well. So we're going to uh, kick off with a quick start uh, by uh, having some opening remarks from the Director of the National Economic Council, Mr. Gene Sperling. Gene? Um, thank you so much for, uh, for being here. Uh, there is no question coming back from the worst recession since the Great Depression is tough sledding. No doubt about it. And uh, there's no doubt that even with the more positive job growth and unemployment news we've gotten lately, we still have a long way to go and we're not close to satisfied. This president's not close to satisfied. Uh, but it is important to note that we have seen in manufacturing 334,000 jobs created over the last two years. That's the best two-year performance since the late uh, uh, 1990s. Uh, and again, it's not enough, but it's an important uh, uh, trend moving in the right direction. Um, what was so uh, uh, positive about the roundtable with the president, and what you'll hear a bit today, is though not only uh, do beyond uh, the trends uh, on job growth or unemployment or manufacturing job growth in the next six to 12 months, the analysis from the experts and the uh, uh, decisions made by the business leaders here makes very clear that there is a very sound and strong economic basis for a new optimism on manufacturing jobs, a new optimism in bringing back both service uh, uh, and manufacturing jobs, and a new optimism in uh, America's uh, ability to compete globally for uh, 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 the best jobs in services uh, and manufacturing uh, around the world. And I think that uh, uh, you're going to hear from people. Uh, we had great experts, uh, Hal Serkin from uh, the Boston Consulting Group, James Manika from McKinsey, Harry Mosier from the Reshoring Institute. But as you'll hear, I think that if there were two things that came through very loud and clear in the President's roundtable, it was one, awareness matters. And I think that a lot of the message you're hearing here and whether they talk about it in terms of total cost of enterprise or total cost of ownership is that the experts here are saying that when companies look at the full cost of their location decisions, number one, and two, when they look at the long-term trends, that the economic case for bringing jobs back to the United States or the economic case for choosing the United States for your next expansion is growing stronger and stronger. And as Hal will talk about, the, the note is very clear that productivity in the United States uh, has continued to strengthen 13% since 2009, and that while there is productivity growth in China, it is not keeping pace with their wages. And so that each and every year going forward, the economic competitiveness case for creating jobs and locating the U.S. becomes stronger, and that for those making a long-term decision about what's best over the next five or 10 years, the case, again, becomes stronger and stronger. And I'll let them go through that. I would also imagine, and maybe something they could discuss, is whether the recent experience with the tsunami and the global supply chain has also made people rethink degree, having some of the more security of when you're selling to the U.S. market, of having more sourcing uh, closer to home. So there are a lot of trends moving uh, uh, in that direction. And we heard, uh, uh, we, we heard the story with Ford, the tremendous uh, commitment to invest, the, the partnership with Bob King, uh, uh, and uh, the story of not 
job, auto jobs going to Mexico, but auto jobs in Mexico or where the, or factories, Mexico, uh, uh, the companies choosing to expand in my home state, Michigan, uh, and in other states is, is a refreshing, refreshing reality that we are hearing about and seeing and is making a difference in our economy right now. Leo Gerard, uh, who is here, talked about very confidently the ability on steel to outcompete in China, given the chance, and obviously ensuring that we have fair trade relationship with China, a level playing field is a critical part uh, of this strategy for manufacturing, for exporting, for regaining our competitiveness. And we heard from people like, uh, uh, you know, Novo One and others, uh, and the, the person who introduced the president, uh, again, being from Michigan, I have to love the outsource to Detroit, but I'm the national economic advisor, so outsource to anywhere in the United States is also very good. Um, uh, but that, uh, uh, that this is about service, this can be about call center jobs, this can be about the most high value added manufacturing jobs as well. So that was the awareness side and getting more companies to go through the calculation that the companies there did. And I encourage you all to talk to them because hearing the, the calculations they made is extremely powerful and just validates what the experts are saying in their uh, reports. And the second thing we heard was that policy matters. And uh, I think for, for the president, it was very reaffirming of the policy direction he has taken and the policy direction we're going to take with more force going forward. Uh, we heard from, uh, you know, Intel talked about the importance of the R&E tax credit, the importance of making it permanent. We've called for expanding it last September. We're going to continue that call and that proposal going forward. The importance of the manufacturing exclusion and making your uh, 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 location choices, the importance of the expensing. And you heard the President say this, and I'll just reinforce it. The, President Obama had gave, given very clear instructions to his economic team that when we are thinking about proposals for our current budget, but also the principles that will guide our efforts at corporate tax reform, that the incentives to create jobs in the United States and particularly manufacturing jobs in the United States should be a guiding principle in our current tax proposals and in our, in our, and in our long term uh, corporate tax reform. And stress too that we have to be very careful that, that we are not ever asking the American taxpayer to subsidize activity uh, moving overseas uh, that is not necessary or that uh, uh, while, of course, uh, uh, decision, decisions that might be legitimate do not, should not uh, bear uh, the subsidization of typical American taxpayers. Of course, everyone understands this is a global economy. These are global companies competing for global markets. They are, of course, going to uh, hire and create jobs in other countries to serve those markets. The president is realistic, his economic team is realistic about that. But when the president asked at the end that at every step you should ask yourself, uh, could your next expansion be in the United States? Could you make your next expansion something that supports the country that supported you? Can you go the extra mile for the country that's gone the extra mile for you? That when he makes that ask, he is asking them uh, uh, to make a decision that is, uh, ha which has increasing economic logic and increasing economic momentum behind that. So with that, I'm very happy that everyone here and people uh, at home watching have the ability to hear firsthand and listen firsthand to what uh, the, the comments and the conversation the President of the United States and President Biden had earlier today. And with that, I will turn it over to our panel. Thank you very much. And actually, I'll just say I'll turn it over to our, our Secretary of Commerce. And when I was saying policy mattered, one of the things that could not have been more important today was the President announced Select USA. I'll let the Secretary of Commerce, who's going to lead that effort, talk about it. But even with the initial effort, two different companies in the room specifically mentioned that the Select USA effort and that effort of the United States government competing and working to make it easier for people to uh, locate here was essential in their decisions. And that is before the very significant expansion 
that the President is announcing and putting his trust in his uh, new and excellent Secretary of Commerce, uh, uh, Bryson, to lead. So with that, I turn over to the Secretary. So thank you very much, Gene. And we owe it to you to be succinct here, uh, and we're going to try to do the things we plan to do over a slightly longer period of time, a meaningfully longer period of time. But I think this morning's session was so strong, and so many of you here in the room, as well as the panel, had the opportunity to describe your business experience, the labor unions who participated, describe their experience in working with the businesses, so I'm going to be quite succinct about that. The heart of what we're saying, as you know, is we're reaching out around the world globally, globally to businesses around the world to say that the U.S. is open for business. I had the great opportunity to do that yesterday at the Detroit Automobile Show. A number of you in this room were there. We saw each other there. Uh, you know, that's an example, by the way, not just a prospective, but what this administration has done, focused on enhancing businesses here in the U.S., and then those businesses responding and creating the U.S. companies, great automobile companies, but just business initiatives, and then those from overseas, the, the automobile companies from overseas with whom I met yesterday, they're responding, of course, with terrific products, investing heavily in the United States, so it's all things coming together. Uh, Gene Sperling talked a little about Select USA. About five or six months ago, the President directed us in the Commerce Department to develop Select USA. This really is a key thing. So lots of businesses, and I talk with lots of businesses, I've talked with many of you in the room. One of the frustrations that businesses have felt is working really as cleanly as possible, as efficiently as possible, across not just one part of the U.S. federal structure, but across all of them. So local levels, cities, counties, states. And what we're doing in Select USA is seeking to bring together the information about working with all these levels of government make it as readily available as possible. The largest of you companies who've done lots of this may find that not as directly helpful as smaller companies, but in the manufacturing chain, the smaller companies are the suppliers in the supply chain, and they only get better, and advanced manufacturing is the way things are going. And what we want to do is just make this as clean as possible. So we'll talk to you a lot about Select USA. Commerce Department based initiative, and that's something I'm devoting a lot of time with a terrific team to. Um, I can go over some other things, and I'm not going to do very much, but I want you to know that one of the things we're doing right now is training our commercial, our foreign commercial service officers. So, in the Commerce Department, the counterpart to the State Department, the State Department people have done diplomacy. Commerce Department, as name suggested, has done commerce. And so we have these people all around the world, based all around the world. But what they've not been trained to do in the past is to reach out to people like all of you here to ask that you invest in the United States and to say, we'll do a lot. We'll do everything we can and we'll listen to you first, but to facilitate your making investments here in the United States. So that's going to be a constant theme. So we've had the lead responsible in the Commerce Department, for example, on growing exports. So we have this five-year target that the President set, doubling the exports in the United States. We're two years down the road. That's going well. There are always challenges there. But now the focus, in addition, is direct investments in the United States. Let me stop there. I could cover more. The heart of what I express, but what we're doing, is we want to help businesses build it here and sell it everywhere. And as you'll hear, for example, from Siemens and many others, that certainly includes the companies whose principal home 
has been outside the United States, but they invest here. I heard it a lot at the Detroit Auto Show. They invest here. That means they build, yes, U.S. automobiles, yes, U.S. supply chain, but many of them export in addition from the U.S. out. So all these things go together. So on the panel, we have Eric Spiegel. You heard from him too briefly this morning, and I asked him to say something more. Brian Kurzanich of Intel, incredible U.S. company. You know that. So I'm going to ask him to say a little more. Kasim Reed, the city of Atlanta, the mayor of Atlanta, home to 14 Fortune 500 companies, which has been particularly strong, also in attracting investments into Atlanta in that area from around the world, and finding Hal Serkin again, who kicked off the panels this morning, had a little more time this morning, but the work that Boston Consulting Group has done to make all of us think harder about this has been very helpful. So, Eric, if I could ask you to kick off, and I said to you, what I'd like you to do, please, is to expand on what you said, and I want to put at least as part of what you address is, are there things in your experience that we could be doing better, significantly better across the United States in making it possible for you speedily to make the investments you'd like to make here? And are there some obstacles, some things that seem to you frustrating, costly, and so on that we ought to know about and see if we can help with? Great. Well, thank you, Secretary Bryson. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Spiegel. I'm the CEO for Siemens here in the U.S. Uh, just a, a brief background, uh, we're uh, one of the world's largest uh, engineering and technology companies. Uh, we operate in 190 countries, uh, well over $100 billion in sales. The U.S. is our largest market uh, with sales in excess of about $25 billion. We have about 65,000 employees here and over 130 manufacturing facilities. I think if you go back in time, uh, Siemens has always, uh, Siemens has been in the U.S. for over 100 years, and Siemens is, we've always manufactured and done business here in the U.S., but we also used to import a lot of our products from Europe, primarily from Germany, but also from other countries. Uh, that's kind of changed itself in the last couple of years, uh, and I'll just give you a couple of examples and then talk about some of the, some of the opportunities and, and issues that we've encountered. Uh, just last November, we opened uh, a, a gas turbine plant in Charlotte. It's the largest uh, gas turbine plant in North America. Uh, we invested uh, several hundred million dollars, created about a thousand new jobs uh, in Charlotte. And the reason for for Charlotte um, A was we got tremendous amount of help from the state of North Carolina and uh, also from various federal agencies in making that happen. Uh, the XM Bank was very instrumental because one of the reasons for putting a plant here. Uh, was was based on being able to export out of here. And I think one of the announcements that you may have seen today is that they announced that we've uh, just signed a deal to, to sell, uh, export 10 gas turbine, large gas turbines to Saudi Arabia, which of course we never would have been able to do uh, in the past with the, without the help of the XM Bank here. And, and we didn't have manufacturing, we just opened that plant in November. But we've also uh, had sales to other countries uh, around the world since we've uh, open that plant. So that's been a tremendous opportunity for us. Uh, I think one of the things to think about that we think a lot about when we when we make investments is uh, the demand. Uh, is there going to be demand for the products? Because while while having an export business is very, very important to us, uh, we also need to have, we want to be close to our customers. We want to see that there's uh, demand for the products here. We want to make sure that we can do R&D. We always like to co-locate our R&D and our manufacturing because we find that that drives innovation much more quickly. We want to make sure there's skilled and productive labor, uh, and the U.S. certainly has some of that. And we want to make sure that there's an infrastructure. I mean, I'll give you an example. In the Charlotte plant, one of the issues we ran into was that uh, there was a retired rail spur uh, near the plant that would take the product uh, on to ultimately be exported out of Virginia. Uh, that rail spur had to be rehabilitated. So people often talk about the infrastructure in the U.S., and I think probably 20, 30 years ago, we had the most modern infrastructure in the world. Uh, but frankly, I think the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers recently gave the U.S. a D on infrastructure. And we've run into it in a lot of our big investments. Uh, that one's an example where we in the state had to go and rehabilitate a rail spur. Otherwise, we would not be able to export, and therefore, we would not have built the plant there. We also built, in the last two or three years, two large wind plants, one in Iowa 
and one in Kansas. The one in Iowa makes blades. The one in Kansas makes nacelles. Uh, those both uh, employ uh, close to 1,000 people. We invested a couple hundred million dollars in those plants. Uh, again, what's the reason for, for building those plants here? Strong demand for renewables. Uh, 29 states have renewable energy standards. Uh, there's been an investment tax credit in place that's made it a good investment for developers. Uh, but again, in both those plants, different circumstances, we had to build a rail spur near the blade plant so we didn't have to truck those blades. The, the blades are 160 feet long and they require two rail cars. So we had to build a rail spur to be able to take it, to get it out to market, to move it. Uh, in the plant in Kansas, we had to build new on-ramps and ingress and egress on the highway to be able to move these huge nacelles, which are almost as large as this room, uh, by truck uh, out to market and things. So when we look at these investments, one of the first things you look at is, is I think as was mentioned early on, is overall, is this a competitive, are we competitive in the U.S. making this? And I think uh, the, the story I told this morning is, I think for the first time, making gas turbines in the U.S., the new plant we have in Charlotte, is as cost competitive with making gas turbines as anywhere in the world. Uh, and that wasn't, that wasn't true a decade ago. But we also look at a bunch of other issues, this one, be, you know, one being infrastructure. Can we move the products out of market and can we move them around the country to be competitive? And I think that's an area, one area where I think the U.S. needs to make some significant uh, investments. Second thing is around uh, skilled labor. We talk a lot about skilled labor in the U.S. and a very productive workforce, and I think those numbers are true. But one of the things we found, uh, particularly in Charlotte and other locations, is there's a skills gap. Uh, we had to spend quite a bit of time and effort to train people to be able to do the kind of uh, high-tech work that you see in this gas turbine plant. Very automated process. I think a lot of stories today of a lot of companies saying that similar plants built today versus 10, 15 years ago require a lot fewer people, but those, few, those people have to have much higher skills. So we've done something we've done in Germany uh, for quite a long time. In Germany, we have about 10,000 apprentices. Uh, 10,000 apprentices just for Siemens. Uh, they go to local technical schools and community colleges, the equivalent over in Germany. They work half-time for Siemens. They go to school half-time. We pay them, and about 80% of those people end up working for us after three or four years if they're qualified and they graduate. Uh, that kind of a program, intensive program, doesn't really exist in the U.S. And those are, in Germany, that's a program that starts with people out of high school. So one of the things we've done around our Charlotte plant, because we need to have people who can run this plant long term, is we started a, a, an apprentice program with about 15 people, uh, 15 students out of high school. They're going to local community, signed an agreement with a local community college. We've helped them develop a curriculum, and we're training those people. They're working part-time. They're going to school part-time in order to be, we have a steady stream of people who can be working in that plant over the long term. This is something that we took on working with the community college, and I think with, this, with the state of North Carolina. Uh, but having more focused efforts, uh, it's, it's great to talk about STEM. We have the biggest, uh, our Siemens Foundation has the largest STEM high school competition in the country. And it's great to talk about what we need to do in the elementary schools and the high schools. But if you want to bring technology manufacturing to the U.S. now, you have to have people who can work in the plants now. And that means we've got to start training people for the jobs of the future. If you want these higher tech, higher paying jobs, you've got to have the people who are trained for it. The average job that we're putting people into in that Charlotte plant is $70,000 a year, okay? These aren't minimum wage kind of jobs. These require a lot of technology and a lot of skills. So again, having very focused programs like the apprentice program that we have there, we also just signed an, uh, an agreement with the University of North Carolina at Charlotte to develop a gas turbine and technology engineering program specific to the plant. There are, because we haven't been building and making a lot of gas turbines in the U.S. in the, in the, in the past decade or so, there aren't a lot of programs designed to develop engineers for that plant. And again, the plant requires a pretty steady stream of engineers. So again, that's a case where we took it in our hands, working with local university, brought, brought over people from Germany to help develop the curriculum in the college to make that happen. So again, very specific, not sort of hoping that someone out there has got a program that's going to give us the right people for those jobs. And the more you want to bring over high-tech manufacturing jobs, and also the service jobs that go with these require the same similar kinds of technical skills. We need to make sure we have people in hand. It can't be something that we're, we're developing people that in five or 10 years will have that kind of capability. I think the, the third thing that's required that uh, I, I think you talked about earlier today was around the manufacturing and investment tax credits. Uh, especially on the R&D side, 
uh, the U.S. is kind of uh, on again, off again with the, oops, sorry, with the research and engineering tax credit. We need to put that thing in place long term so that we can make longer term investments in research with, uh, you know, we, we've uh, got research programs going on with over 20 universities. Uh, we're doing a lot of work around cities right now, uh, uh, doing a lot of investment. Uh, we do a lot of work with uh, the federal government on research and development. But we've got to make sure those credits are in place long term so that the, the, the programs aren't start and stop. You can't do uh, big time research and development on new technologies on a 12 month, uh, 12 month basis. So that's really important. And then I think the program you talked about, Secretary Bryson, the Select US, it is very difficult. We're a big company, we have a lot of resources. So putting together um, a new investment for new plants like the ones in Charlotte and Kansas and Iowa, we're also expanding our light rail train facility out in Sacramento. Uh, we have the resources to go and do that. But for smaller companies, I can imagine it's very complex very dealing with all the federal agencies and the state and local governments, making sure you're getting all the tax credits and things you can get uh, and all the incentives you can get, but also making sure that you can get the plant built on time and on budget and that you can also do things like uh, have permits and things to export. Very complex, and I think that's something that having something like Select USA where that they can help really help you take that thing from soup to nuts, I think will be a big help. Eric, thank you very much. Brian. Uh, Intel is a jewel of the United States without any doubt. What can we do to help you in any respect uh, make it such? I mean, Intel, notwithstanding costs, notwithstanding obstacles, has repeatedly expanded right here in the United States. State of Oregon, uh, great beneficiary of that, <laughs> happens to be my home state, but. What you've done uh, widely is a lot. We still, we ought to be able to improve. We ought to respond to your presence here, your commitments here, the extraordinary work you do. Are there things we can be doing to make it more possible, better, <coughs> lower cost, you more competitive? Yeah, um, thank you, Secretary. So, <coughs> as you said, we have a long history. I, I think we are more of a story, less of insourcing as versus uh, continuing to source our manufacturing from America. We have about 80% of our R&D dollars are spent in the U.S. and about 75% of our manufacturing is done in the U.S. Although two-thirds of our product is shipped overseas. So we are a great story of really made in the USA. And, and the latest two projects we announced, we announced last year uh, two new factories we're building, one in Portland, Oregon, and one in Phoenix, Arizona, which will be about 8 to $10 billion of additional spending and capital and bring four to 5,000 construction jobs during the construction and, you know, 1,000 or more uh, manufacturing jobs. And, and as Eric said, these are not the classic manufacturing jobs maybe our fathers thought about. Um, these are 70, 80, $100,000 jobs that are good careers. And, and I always like to think of myself as an example of manufacturing as a career. I have 30 years at Intel, all of it in manufacturing. I started on, as an engineer on the factory floor and made manufacturing my career. Uh, and I'm proud that I run the manufacturing for Intel now. The typical things that we run into, as, as we said, was it's very important that manufacturing and R&D, especially in our industry, be located very close to each other. We run an industry based on innovation, uh, driven by Moore's Law, one of our founders, Gordon. Uh, and that really requires a two-year technology cycle. And you want that research and development right next to your factory. So the R&D credits are critical. When they are always in question and you're wondering whether they're going to be there year after year, it's hard to make the billion plus dollars per year investment in R&D that Intel does. And so that's, that's a very critical one that we need a long-term commitment from the U.S. that says, we see the connection between R&D and manufacturing, and we're committed. And that would be very important. We talked about the manufacturing tax credits. We believe that we should get credit for bringing those jobs and making those investments. Uh, you know, our capital uh, expenditure for Intel last year was $10 billion. Uh, most of that, uh, largest percentage of that went into manufacturing. So again, we are investing in those factories, and we have to continually invest. The other one, as was mentioned already, is infrastructure. 
we often want to go build one of these very large factories in a city like Chandler, Arizona, uh, or Ron Lair Acres, Oregon, and we can sometimes tax the infrastructure. Uh, we have to spend about $200 million in Arizona, for example, on the waste treatment plant. And the city really can't afford to do that, uh, to upgrade the waste treatment plant, to handle the extra capacity. And so we're actually having to fund it. Having some kind of joint program where the city and the state could go to the federal government and we could work together to help fund that infrastructure would have taken $200 million out of a project that's about $2 billion. So 10% of a project's cost. Um, you know, and then, and then lastly is just the overall income tax rate. You know, Intel's at the, paid about 32% income last year, income tax. Uh, about $4 billion, a little over $4 billion. Uh, and so lowering that number could be beneficial to help let us reinvest more into these factories and expand our capacity even further. So I think those are the real big key items that, that would help keep us reinvesting in America. Brian, thank you very much. There's a lot of overlap, in fact, nearly complete overlap with the priorities that Eric set out. So I'm not, not exactly running perfectly on time schedule here. <clears throat> what I want to do just extremely briefly is ask Kasim to talk about the experience in Atlanta. And if you do this very briefly. Okay. And what I'm going to do then is, because I want to preserve time, and we'll only have on the order of 10 minutes, uh, but I want to give those of you in the audience the opportunity to put the questions you'd like to put. And if I have to push it a little longer, I would. But, Kasim, if you'd help me, uh, you gave a good presentation on Atlanta. The story's a really strong one, and here is part of what we're talking about, bringing the federal government, local governments, state governments, together and in ways that make, that, that help, yeah. and I, often that may be significantly help the smaller businesses, but all the things that, uh, that have been described here are relevant to businesses, and we've got competitively to stand, to strengthen the businesses of the United States. This is a competitive global world, and we're not gonna succeed, and perhaps most of you know, that we are, we have been, by one description, the last of the major, major business countries in the world that hasn't had a long-term competitive strengthening plan. We've been pretty short-term, so we have not done all we ought to do in this area. So, Kasim. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, I will be brief. I think that uh, my focus today was really uh, what can cities do and what can the federal government do to be a friend uh, to business. And I just cited uh, specific examples. Atlanta is the home uh, to 14 uh, Fortune 500 businesses. And what I've seen is uh, we can make sure that we're responding faster uh, than we ever have before. So that includes uh, what kind of incentives we provide, but it also includes making sure that the government responds rapidly when there is a decision that needs to be made that will create jobs. And to the extent that that becomes a part of the federal government's culture, then I believe that it will help cities' competitiveness. And since 80% of our nation's GDP occurs in cities, it will help the nation's competitiveness. Specifically, uh, when we were uh, recruiting the headquarters for Porsche North America, uh, which is certainly foreign direct investment, Porsche had never built a headquarters for North America before. But well, we attracted them to the campus at Hartsfield-Jackson Airport uh, in order to close that deal after putting significant incentives on the table from the city and from the state. We had to have a great deal of cooperation from the FAA because of the proximity of the headquarters to our airport. It's literally on the campus. Well, we took a closed automobile plant, and now we're going to build a $100 million headquarters for an iconic company and attract 250 jobs initially and expand to about 350 jobs. We're gonna have a call center on that campus. Uh, and I think it was a great example for what happens when government acts expeditiously. I don't think that the FAA could have been a better partner in that process. We had one other opportunity recently uh, where we attracted $300 million in investment into a one million uh, square foot building that had been shuttered and closed. Uh, Jamestown is a private equity fund that's financed by German capital. Uh, because we had cooperation 
uh, from the government. We were able to secure national historic tax credits that helped bring that deal to life. So to the extent that government responds and acts like it cares, cares about job creation, I think that's going to be transformational. But when you have a deal, a leader of a city or a governor has to be able to engage the federal government, show that we have a real deal on the table, lay out the jobs case, and once you determine it's valid, act with the kind of speed and energy that I think is warranted when all of our priority is priorities is job creation. So uh, that's what I was asking the president and vice president for uh, and asking uh, the Commerce Department for Mr. Secretary. Thank you very much. All right. I'd like to solicit now questions, comments from all of you in the audience. Let me underscore that all four panel members are good candidates for responses to questions you have. So yes, I saw you first. Secretary, uh, I'm Nancy McLernan with the Organization for International Investment, and we are very pleased um, that the administration is holding this event today. Uh, I was pleased to hear about um, your focus and thoughts for expanding Select USA. As you know, the trend of foreign investment in the United States has been on a declining trend, and the thought of putting some real muscle behind a, a group like Select USA is, uh, is great to hear. I'd like to know. Um, what uh, maybe some of the panelists might think of an idea, uh, as well as yourself, about an idea that the Jobs Council, the President's Jobs Council, put forward last October, which was to establish a national investment initiative, similar to the idea of a national export initiative, but this would focus on increasing foreign direct investment by a trillion dollars over the next four or five years. So making it a national imperative, somewhat like we did with exports. And so would like to get the, the thoughts of those on the panel, if, if something like that might be helpful, elevating the, the desire to increase foreign direct investment in the United States. And then, and then if you could share any thoughts on that yourself, that'd be great. I'll, I'll simply start by saying, and I won't I want to turn it to the panel, and then I'd be happy to send something after that. But I, I do want to commend the Jobs Council. Um, Select USIA is an idea that arose in the Commerce Department. Uh, to his great credit, the President took up the idea and the Jobs Council. And the, I think the effect of the Jobs Council recognizing the opportunity here and then underscoring it and then saying very directly in its report, nice idea, but you have way too few resources relative to what's being done competitively by the major business countries with their longer term and deeper and much more strongly supported plans around the world. So that's, that's a very big thing. And I'll see if I have anything to add, but let me see whether any of you on the panel have something to say to, with respect to that. I know none of you on the panel will want to take up the responsibility precisely of what the federal government ought to be doing by way of expanding resources in this area, but I welcome any comments from any of you. Well, I'll, I'll just say a few words. Um, given that we've been putting a lot of foreign direct investment into the U.S. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think one of the things I heard today at the meeting around the table and from the president was that, uh, and I think you, your quote at the beginning, the U.S. is open for business. And I know you've said through the Select USA that w one of your top objectives is encouraging more foreign direct investment. And I think a focused effort around that would be important. I think uh, foreign direct, about 5% of the jobs are in the U.S. are from foreign owned companies. It's about 15, but it's about 15% of the manufacturing, 14% of the R&D spending. Uh, it's, you know, foreign companies uh, are driving a lot of the manufacturing growth in this country, and we've been one of those companies doing that. And I think the more we can let, you know, companies like, like Siemens and some of the other companies we had around there today around the world know that we're trying to encourage foreign direct investment in the U.S., and we're doing what we can to, to bring it here. Because I think for years, there was, a, you know, there was some some thought out there that it wasn't the most important thing in the U.S., right? That, that creating jobs, not just creating jobs, but, but encouraging foreign companies to invest here was a priority. And I think what I heard today is it is a priority. And I think if we make it a priority and put some muscle behind it, uh, I think you're going to see a lot more foreign investment here. This is the biggest market in the world, and it's got all the advantages I talked before. And when you run the numbers, uh, I think the U.S. is looking more and more attractive every day. So we're, we're very bullish on the U.S. Thank you, Eric. 
I Hell think, did I see, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think you want to give foreign direct investment in the U.S. a push. And, and I think you want to do it now because we're starting to get to a point where the economics continue to change in favor of the U.S. And so speeding up is always a good thing. Um, you know, if you look at our, our worker productivity, it's amongst the highest in the world, higher than Germany. If you look at productivity even versus China, we're 3.4 times as productive as China. Uh, and China's seeing wages rise and other things. So it's a very good time for people to, for companies to think about U.S. as an investment, whether it's U.S. companies investing in the U.S. or foreign companies investing in the U.S. And as, as we said before, you know, we are a huge market and we will remain a huge market for a long, long time. Uh, and when you think about increasing transportation costs and other things, the U.S. is an incredibly attractive place. What we are doing now, is, 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 as far as I can tell inside the government, uh, and I'm not part of the government, um, but it, they're start, we're starting to recognize that the, the need to do these kinds of things. Uh, it was an assumption in the past that it, they would just happen. And we see with USA Select and other kinds of activities, uh, the beginnings of pushing forward on these kinds of topics. And those are things that China is doing, those are things that Germany are doing, and we're catching up. And I think what we'll see is a fair amount of increased investment because uh, even at the euro 130 to the dollar, uh, the U.S. economy looks incredibly attractive as a place to manufacture. It's very hard to export things from Europe to the U.S. because it's just that much more expensive to make in Europe. Good. Others? Yes. Secretary, uh, you, we, we applaud what you're trying to accomplish here in America and make this a place to grow and build things. I own a steel factory in Baltimore, uh, and like Intel, we make everything in the USA in, out of Baltimore. We export to 35 countries. However, one of the things that hamstrings us is our tax policy. Um, I compete with Canada, and they have an 18% rate, and it's declining. And that includes health insurance for all their employees. I, 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 like, I mean, Intel pays 32% taxes. I have a higher tax rate than that because everything goes through m me personally, okay? And I have to pay Blue Cross and Blue Shield for my employees on top of the high 40% rate. So I think something that you could do to help us, and President Obama can do to help us, is to make our tax rates competitive so that we could beat Canada and we could beat Germany, and we could beat China, and more jobs will be created here, and then we'll be able to hire more unemployed Baltimore City steel workers. That's, that's powerful and absolutely critically important. I think you likely know that the President is committed to doing that. Now, a reality is right now, at this time, in this Congress, where it's been so hard to get anything passed, May not be the most, may not be the time in which this gets done. Uh, but I mean, I can tell you candidly, I've been part of a very large number of planning dialogues across this federal government on how we can do that, how to structure it, and so on. So there's a lot of work being done on it. I hope something can be done as soon as it possibly could be achieved. I mean, Gene Sperling talked about how this is a, incentives for manufacturing should be a guiding principle. Yeah. I, I think he's right. Yeah. We should do it. Yes. Yeah. You know, perhaps you know, the president also asked me to lead a manufacturing coordination effort across the federal government. So it's a big focus of mine. I'll do that with Gene. In other words, Gene will do the White House policy of it, but the practical kind of reaching out to all of you. And I'd like to get your name and follow up direct conversation, we'll put a big emphasis on that. Yes, and can you do these kind of, I need now to have a sort of one minute and I won't even respond unless it's. My name is, is Paul Fichter, I have a company called Tap Handles out of Seattle, I have about 600 employees. I just opened two new factories in the United States, one in Seattle, one in Chicago that will create about 250 jobs. Um, but my, my experience is not in complete concordance with theirs because there are these mega billion dollar companies mm -hmm. and I'm yes. just a small company. Yep. Um, and so the navigating these programs doesn't really work for a company like mine. I got no help from Seattle. I was under the radar for HUD and so forth, and Chicago wasn't that interesting either. We just did it on our own. Um, but I'd like to discuss more, like echo this, where in growing years, my tax rate can approach 90% on a cash basis. And so there's other things that companies like mine could use that might be different than the Intels and Siemens, and I hope mm -hmm. you're getting a chance to hear us too. Good. That's important. Now let me say we're going to turn right after this. Karen Mills, who is the back of the room, has just walked in, 
has headed the Small Business Administration in this, under the Obama administration. She has done extraordinary things in effective leadership, taking this much further than had ever been done in the past and reaching out to smaller and medium-sized businesses. So that'll be very much on the agenda. Karen can describe some of the things they've been doing. Select USA is very much a part of the future with respect to this. So stay with the next panel, and I think we can give more attention to that. Now, yes, please introduce yourself, and we'll do one minute. And I can do you and one more, and then I'm going to have to stop. My name is Jay Salkini. I'm the founder of a company called People Networks. It's the largest manufacturer of uh, GSM base stations and switching systems for the telecom industry. My question is actually to Mr. Eric here. Uh, I am an ex-employee of Siemens and I'm proud to be one of the examples that you mentioned about putting students through school. Uh, Siemens put me through Florida Atlantic University in Boca Raton where you used to have your telecom infrastructure groups. My question to you is how, uh, why did Siemens leave the telecom industry in the U.S.? Uh, Siemens left, Lucent uh, integrated with Alcatel, Northern North bankrupt. We have no more <coughs> companies in the U.S. that manufacturing cellular equipment. And what can the federal government and the president do to get these companies back in here and expand back on the telecom so we can compete with Huawei and others? Yeah. Uh Unfortunately, that was, um, by the way, I'm, I'm glad to hear your story. I'd like to chat about that later. Uh, the exit from the telecom business took place. I've been with Siemens for a couple of years, and that took place uh, before my time. But uh, I, I think uh, with the new CEO, Peter Loescher, coming in five years ago, the emphasis was really on reshaping the portfolio uh, around businesses that we saw uh, where we could drive global technology and be competitive and things. And so that was a decision made before that. Uh, I, it's a good question about what the U.S. does. I'm, <laughs> I'm not an expert on the telecom market, so I really don't, don't have much to say to that. All right, and last one, and my regrets for not being able to reach others, but yes. Mr. Secretary, my, my name is George Schindler, and I work for a global IT services firm, and I run our U.S. operations. We're very committed to opening what we call onshore software del uh, delivery centers. Uh, across the U.S. We've got three centers today, a thousand jobs created. Um, both businesses here talk today about the importance of having manufacturing tax credits as part of that. Um, what I'd like to see is, uh, or hear about your plans for potentially broadening those manufacturing, traditional manufacturing, into other manufacturing like software development. Any others? Uh, with regard to manufacturing, the, what president asked me to take on is not limited, it's not narrowly defined in any respect right now. It needs to be fleshed out. Now we've launched the facility at, at NIST here, which is part of the Commerce Department of the National Institute of Standards and Technology. It integrates, by the way, the entire federal government. So this, as I said, is a coordination across the entire federal government. So I can't give you a very direct answer right now, but we should be able to follow up. Good. So thank you very, very much. I appreciate your being here, your engagement. I'd like to have more questions, but what I want to do, do we need to do something? Should, is the idea to take a break or continue straight on? All right. So then Karen Mills, whom I introduced, and I don't see right now, but I'm sure we'll walk right into the room right now. She's an extraordinary leader, incredibly smart, strong business background, and she's going to make a real further difference uh, in, I think, for many of you, but particularly the small and medium-sized businesses. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, if we get the other uh, uh, panelists for the second panel to come down, I see uh, Harold here, Mary uh, Murcott, Bruce Cochran, and John Hepner, if you guys could all join us as well. Great. Well, thank you all for uh, um, your engagement in the last panel. Uh, we were going to uh, just power right through, decided not to take a break, knowing that uh, um, we have a tight timeline here and want to respect your time. So we're going to move directly into the second panel, which is uh, titled Competing at Home, How Businesses Are Making It in the U.S. 
Um, this will be a little bit more focused on uh, some of the small business components, uh, manufacturing, supply chain, a lot of the elements uh, that, that have already been discussed today. So um, I, I will uh, uh, leave it to our moderator to uh, introduce the panelists, um, but I get the pleasure of introducing her. You've heard a little bit of, uh, about her, uh, having the chance to work with her uh, nearly every day in our business engagement. It's an incredible honor to introduce Karen Mills, who's the administrator of the Small Business Administration. Well, um, thanks, and thanks to John um, for that introduction and uh, for all of the work um, that we're doing together to focus on manufacturing and now to focus on bringing that manufacturing back to this, this country. Um, we have a great panel, and we're going to ask for some of your questions, and we're going to uh, take as many as possible. Um, I do want to just say a couple words about some of the things we talked about this morning and the Small Business Administration. One of the things the President said this morning is that what we want to do with large companies and small companies is give those folks who are going to choose to manufacture here, who are going to choose to provide services here, all the tools they need to be able to grow their business. And that means access to financing, which for small businesses has been an issue over the past several years, and we at the SBA provide loan guarantees. We actually had a record year last year and did more loan guarantees than ever before in SBA history, $30 billion. So we are all over the country working with about 5,000 banks. And if you haven't asked your banks about an SBA loan guarantee, uh, we'll talk about that shortly. Another thing that I want to make sure that you are aware of um, is we just were able to renew something called the Small Business Innovation Research Grants. And um, it has, was the first time in about six years that we got permanent congressional authority. And it was a bipartisan bill that passed, so don't let anybody tell you that nothing is happening. Because we were able to get support for small businesses getting uh, SBIR grants. It's two and a half billion dollars, and once again, this is for you and your small business to do research that will help you innovate here in this country. So we have an array uh, of things, including uh, activity in the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership, designed to make sure that entrepreneurs can continue to innovate here, that large companies um, can have supply chains full of some of the, the best entrepreneurs. Lastly, we will talk a little bit about supply chains, and we heard from some larger companies. There are opportunities for small companies in the supply chains of these larger companies as they bring um, back production and activity. And we want to make sure that those connections get made. So we have started the American Supplier Initiative. It involves um, everything from matchmaking, which we do. We run the federal government's small business supply chain, which is about $100 billion, doing state-of-the-art activity for the Defense Department, for instance. Lots and lots of those suppliers are able to uh, be available and are interested in doing commercial products as well. So let's get started uh, in our panel. And, um, You've heard some of these stories mentioned by the President earlier, but I think, um, Harold, if it's all right, uh, we'll start with the basics again, being the fact-based analyst. Okay. It's, so actually, it's actually Harry. Could, pardon? Harry. Oh, I'm it's sorry. It's wrong on there. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. That's okay. Then how, uh, how, how can you frame this for us? What is happening? And, and you said some things earlier to the President. Um, we had just some of the basic facts, but what are the key um, metrics that you can share with us about how the economics have changed? Okay, I, I, think, I think Hal covered that somewhat on the previous panel. Yep. And so the, you know, the, the basics of, of his message and the one that we also carry is that, is that the, the costs in, in, in China and other countries, but especially China because they're the 800-pound gorilla in offshoring, that they're rising rapidly, that their, their wage rates expressed in dollars are going up at 20 to 25 percent a year, while U.S. employment costs are going up at uh, 2 percent a year, 0, 1 percent a year. And, and therefore, even though they're starting much lower, when you go up that fast, every, every th three years you double. And so they're rapidly approaching a point where their total cost will get close enough to the U.S. total cost that when you include 
let's say their, their cost of manufacturing will get close enough to the U.S. cost of manufacturing that we, when you include what we call the total cost of ownership, when you include the duty and the freight and the packaging and the, the uh, inventory cost while the products en route, the, the intellectual property risk, the travel to go see them, the, you know, all these extra costs that aren't the case when you deal with your supply chain and buy from somebody locally, then, then when the companies recognize all those costs, then they are much more likely to make the decision to uh, bring the work back here. So as, as Hal pointed out, you know, th these t our cost is here, the Chinese cost is coming up here. There still is a difference, and there still will be a difference in 2015, which is his year for convergence, unless the companies recognize this total cost, because that typically is 20 to 30 percent of, of the total cost, these hidden costs that many of the companies don't recognize. As an example that I gave this morning, one of the major aerospace companies I talked to, I asked them how do they make their decision about what to uh, uh, make here and what to offshore. And they said, well, here's an example. Here's this, sounded like a thousand pound housing, and we, we have it made in the U.S., and then we air freight it to China to be machined, and we air freight it back to be uh, plated, we are afraid it back to have something else done, we are afraid it back to the U.S. to be installed into the, into the aerospace product. And they said when we try and decide whether to do it all here in the U.S. or do this, we only look at the prices from the suppliers, we do not include the air freight, we do not include the carrying cost on the inventory, we do not include any of the risks involved. And that's stupid. You know, if you're not looking at all your costs, you can't make right decisions. So, so what we, the Reshoring Initiative, do, we're a nonprofit organization, we provide a free software so that the companies can use it to make the right decision and recognize those extra 20 or 30 percent of the costs and therefore more often and sooner decide to bring more of the work back to the United States, either to their own facilities or to their, or to so people in the U.S. supply chain. So Bruce, you've become now the poster child for um, an industry which everybody thinks is dead in uh, this country, furniture. And um, you saw your own family's business move overseas after it was sold. And then after years of being in that market, being in Asia, um, I, you told me it occurred to you that, you know, people wanted made in America furniture. And you could come back and, uh, and do that. And like a great entrepreneur, uh, John Tommy said to his wife, um, we're, we're going to go home and make our own furniture, and we're going to put every penny we own into it. And uh, she said to him, what, last month, yes, we've done that. So um, <laughs> mission, mission accomplished on that. But um, he is back in North Carolina um, employing people, I think, that you had, uh, um, had in the family business and in the same factory as the family business. What makes a sector like furniture now able to be produced um, back in this country? And how do you see growing that business? When we sold our company back in 1997, um, we employed almost 1,400 people. And over the subsequent years, that, all, that, all that production was moved overseas and all the capital investment was dismantled and sold and uh, I subsequently went to Asia myself and started sourcing products for manufa furniture manufacturers in Asia, specifically in China. So I was part of the problem of dismantling a $50 billion industry, furniture industry. And as the years went by, I saw the, uh, uh, the, the cheap abundant labor in China uh, diminish and in 2006, uh, there, were, there were serious labor shortages uh, in, in China, especially in some of the labor-intensive industries. And everything that's symptomatic of labor shortages, which is poor quality, uh, increased cycle times, delivery times, um, were horrendous. And that was coupled with uh, 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 changing currency and increased in shipping cost. And then in 2010, uh, I realized that some of the ancillary cost involved 
uh, that my customers were, were seeing and they were starting to capture, it really made a lot of sense to start manufacturing furniture back in the United States again, especially the kind of furniture that uh, I was accustomed to making in the years past. And when I got in this business in 1974, there were literally dozens and dozens of people that made fine furniture with fine cabinet joinery, traditional cabinet joinery, and that has all but disappeared in the United States. Many people don't really realize what a fine piece of furniture looks like anymore. So I realized that I could not only make a, uh, a very uh, competitively priced product, I could make something that the Chinese were probably unwilling to make. And I could make the finest furniture uh, with traditional cabinet joinery, the finest furniture made in the world. And I could do this with state-of-the-art technology. And I could do this with uh, uh, an American worker that is highly product productive. Hal Serkin had mentioned that the American worker was 3.4 times more productive than the, than the Chinese worker. Well, I would contend that when you get in these higher labor jobs, that, that, uh, that differential is much greater. So those were the things that went through my mind that, uh, that gave me pause to say, yes, I can do it here again. And I had the opportunity and had the very good fortune to work with uh, Carolina Trust Bank in Lincoln, North Carolina. It's a small community bank, but they agreed to do all of our equipment financing, which was, uh, which was very, very helpful. And uh, Karen had mentioned the uh, SBA loans. When, when uh, my banker first, when he mentioned SBA loans, I said, oh no, this is, this is just an onerous mountain of paperwork. But uh, he, he indicated that that paperwork had been reduced in, in drastically and, and, and <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it's really, and, and he is actually, here's a banker that's actually touting an SBA loan because the paperwork was not, uh, was not too much anymore. And he, he, as a matter of fact, this particular bank had, had done quite a few uh, SBA loans in the past, it, uh, we, he was able to identify another loan program that had a 90% guarantee uh, that was very, very helpful. It wasn't SBA, but it was, uh, it was another federal lo uh, loan guarantee that, uh, uh, or actually the federal government provided the money for the state to make the guarantees. I think that was the mechanism. But capital continues to be a, a very, very difficult when you raise equity in a private equity offering like Lincoln and Furniture did. Uh, in, in that private equity offering, you seek to sell a limited number of investors, uh, a minimum investment is $50,000. It's very, very difficult, especially when you don't have anything to show them. Um, but we did raise some money, but there continues to be, um, and I've had spoken to Karen about it, uh, there, there continues to be for small businesses issues of capital, especially working capital. I think some of the programs that are available now, you can get really good equipment financing, and we got all the equipment financing we needed. Uh, but then there's working capital issues, and we're not talking about money that, that, uh, that so I want somebody to give me. I'm talking about money that uh, it would give us a comfort zone and a comfort level and help, help us operate in a manner uh, that we wouldn't have to be always wringing our hands about the capital issues, and uh, and we're not talking about a lot of money either. You know, we're talking about a quarter of a million dollars to a half a million dollars, and for a lot of businesses, a lot of small businesses like mine, just to have that cushion would be a great help. So, uh, well, I thank you very much for that mention of the SBA, and particularly. Um, as you know, the president has all across the administration <clears throat> tasked us with reducing and simplifying. And I will say that when I got this job, my husband said to me, oh, too, you know, SBA, too much paperwork, too much time. Well, now we are down from this much paperwork to this much paperwork, and um, we have shortened all of our cycle times as well. So loan turnaround time is in the days, not even the weeks and the months. So we are, um, I think, recognizing that particularly in the past few years, there's a lot of small businesses out there with the um, interest in expanding, but they don't necessarily meet all of the criteria um, because they've just suffered through a couple of tough years. We will provide now, and this is one of the announcements of today, a 90% loan guarantee on uh, certain insourcing 
And Dario Gomez, who's there, I'm going to have you stand up because I bet there's somebody in this audience who, um, like John is, uh, like Bruce is, looking for a um, extra piece of capital. And we have a particular working capital line that we just um, simplified as well, called the cap lines. And we have 5,000 banks, as I said, out there working with us on exactly this uh, effort. And this is a place where government can come in and put the wind at the back of small businesses. Mary. Well, uh, wait a minute. How many of you have um, made a call to a call center and, and it's been picked up and you realize you're probably talking to somebody in this country? I don't know. Recently, uh, you've begun a trend. We've begun a trend. I've been helping as a consultant and now as a CEO of an outsourcing company that's completely onshore, helping companies come back to the United States. I'm a founding member of Jobs for America. Jim Kallenberger's over here, and he's also helped started it. And we're dedicated to bringing 100,000 jobs back in the contact center world. It's not working over there. Um, and, and I think many, you know, many of us have had a good call over there, but it's not extensible. It's not repeatable often. And you know the reason call centers went over there 10, 15, 20 years ago uh, no longer exists. It was the easy calls we first sent over there, password resets, things like that. Those calls are gone. They've all been automated, right? So what's left are the contextually sensitive, the complex problem-solving sc skills, the ones you need good communication skills. And if we're having a hard time understanding them, just think, they're having a hard time understanding us. So. You know, there has been a myopic focus on next quarter earnings by the CEO, in turn, a myopic fo focus on um, unit cost and cost per minute. Um, and they're not looking at total cost of ownerships. When we, we have an operating model and we help companies show them how they can do it 15% cheaper in the United States if they take all those costs into account. So the fact that they pay uh, half the cost in labor cost doesn't make any difference if it takes three calls to get your problem resolved, right? I mean, that's real simple math. In addition, the handle time is 52% to 100% higher over there. So again, cost per minute goes out the way, by the wayside. That just doesn't make economic sense in an operating model. So there are many other things, like if you haven't solved a customer's problem, what's the ability to cross-sell or put them in another product? Um, what's the What's the focus on your brand? I think people have done a lot of brand damage by putting their, their call centers over there. I mean, sometimes you only have, with your credit card company, you talk to them once a year. Don't you want that four to 10 minute call to be an emotional connection with your customer? I think you do. And so my company is dedicated to improving the customer brand, to improving the customer experience and long-term loyalty, because it's really not about short-term um, profit, it's about long-term loyalty and viability of the companies. So, you know, it's not cheaper to do business over there. Um, our customers don't like it. And in fact, a lot of call centers have come back. 3% of all working Americans are working in call centers right now. Um, only 12% of call centers are offshore. Three years ago, 30% of all high-tech call centers were offshore. Now it's 12%, I think. So they're coming back, but nobody's talking about it. And here's why. Number one, a lot of people don't want to make, uh, talk about the mistake they made. Right? Um, we have some people up here that you know, have, have, have been completely honest and said, hey, mistakes have been made. We shouldn't have been offshore. So the mistakes have been made. Um, also, they, can't, they may have come back, but they can't say so because another division hasn't brought their, so they don't toot their own horn because another division still is offshore. And it would confuse the brand if you said we've brought our, our calls back. And, and that's not the case with another division of the same company. Um, and lastly, a lot of these companies come back, see it as competitive edge. Go ahead, leave your calls offshore. Leave them offshore, you're hurting yourself. Um, so I, you know, I think that, that a lot of people are coming back. Um, there's a lot of examples. Um, and uh, you know, my CFO and I all the time sit down with companies and show them the new operating model. And we're happy to do so, even if they don't come to my outsourcing company. Uh, you know, just happy to bring them back. That's great. I come from the great state of Maine, and you know where this sort of iconic mm -hmm. LL Bean yes. customer experience, and um, there really, you know, is a proven connection uh, between the customers and because of those customer service people. Well, the fact mm -hmm. is, also, it's not a minimum wage job anymore. These, you know, what's left are those contextually sensitive. The average call center worker makes probably thirteen, fourteen, fifteen dollars an hour. 
there might be some down in the $10, $11 an hour wage level, and then they go up to 100000 for technical support and things like that, sales jobs. So they're not minimum wage jobs. In fact, if we have in our center a number of people, husband and wives, that work there, and their, their family now is in middle class. They both work in a call center on the phones, and they're middle class. I also have four generations working in our call center. It's great for older people. They have great mature judgment. I have one woman on the phone that is 92 years old, Miss Charlene, and she recruits for the Army, and she does a heck of a good job about it. There you go. Um, so, you know, these are not minimum wage jobs. They are harder, complex jobs. And what's required, I think, and I mentioned this to the president, is we need to get our high school education graduation rate up. Some of these jobs require college. All of them require high school communication skills, written, oral, complex, hard thinking, critical problem solving. And when I walk into cities, and frequently I walk into major cities that have 50, 60 percent graduation rates out of high school, I can't be there. So I move and I select a I select a city that has 85, 90 percent graduation rates. So we're going to have to think about being competitive within the United States, and we'll start competing for those jobs as they come back. Well, that leads, I think, John, into some of the things that you mentioned earlier about workforce training. Um, I will say master lock. I mean, when you think about it, how, who has a master lock? You know, you probably I want to see all the know hands that here. brand. Yeah, yeah. Here we I go. know that brand. Um, <laughs> And you're producing in Milwaukee, and uh, one of the things I think the president talked about um, um, when he introduced you this morning, uh, he said that you're at capacity now for the first time in a long time, and what you said is, boy, I need more skilled workers. I've got business. I can do business here. I can ship it overseas. I need to make sure I'm working with the community colleges and with others for building the skilled workforce. Absolutely. So I'm John Hebner. I'm the, the CEO yeah. of uh, Master Lock, and uh, uh, we make locks. I know that surprises you. Uh, about 65 million a year. That's that's pretty big. That's a lot of locks. I always had the theory that people threw them in the ocean. That's why we make so many a year. <laughs> um, but uh, our story is is a little different. We're we're about a medium sized company. We're part of. Uh, a New York stock exchange traded company called Fortune Brands Home and Security. And um, I go if you take Masterlock and you go back to the late 90s, like a lot of other companies, uh, as a matter of survival, we outsourced uh, many of our jobs to, to China and to Mexico. Uh, what, what happened back then is we had a facility with about 1,200 people in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, that uh, we, we kept open. Uh, we kept about 300 people, I think, at the time. And, um, and now I can say we're up to 400 people and growing. Uh, some of the challenges, I mean, you've heard about the economics, so the economics are working in our favor and we're moving jobs back and, and, and we feel good about that. And when you're a businessman and you're making those decisions, economics plays a huge role in the decision to move jobs back. And so we're, we're seeing that dynamic change um, for all the reasons that you heard today and we won't go back into that. Uh, and uh, some of the things we talked about today were, well, what could make that happen faster? And so I thought I'd just share with you some of the challenges that we've had and we talked about earlier today is just our access to skilled labor. And that, that's something that is very important to us. And when we talk about skilled labor, we're talking about machine build and repair, we're talking about electricians, we're talking about electronics people, we're talking about tool and die makers, and we're talking about a higher level of skilled people than we were 10 years ago. Because the jobs we're bringing back now, we're bringing back to a much more automated facility, a higher tech facility than we had uh, during the late 1990s. And so what the challenges that's put in front of us is how do, you, how do you go out and recruit for skilled tradespeople? Because honestly, there's a couple of things that have gone on uh, with, with the transition of manufacturing out of the U.S., a lot of people have lost their jobs and a lot of those people were skilled trades and they went to find other things to do. Then you have the new generation up and coming going to high school and they don't have shop class anymore. And it's hard to aspire to something you've never been introduced to. So we've had those challenges as well. How do you, how do you get the younger generation, how do you get the students to want to aspire to go into manufacturing and to have that job? Because we have a gap, we have a real gap in this country. I mean, our, if I look at our skilled trades people, we're, we're approaching 55 plus in terms of an age group because we have a gap and we're going to have to fill that gap and if we're going to bring back jobs faster in this country uh, we're going to have to do some pretty intense training 
And some of the things we've done is we've partnered with many of the local technical colleges and some of the universities. We've done that uh, in terms of being on their boards, participating in, in how the curriculums are built, financing that, and then allowing people to enter those programs to earn an apprentice and a journeymanship after about five years of training. So it's a long process, but at the end of the day, it benefits us and it benefits them. So we've been on that road for a while. And uh, so we talked about some things this morning about how can we get um, better training, faster training, and how can we make uh, manufacturing a business that uh, kids aspire to coming out of school. So that's really critical. You know, I was in uh, Minneapolis. We were announcing a partnership with the National Association of Manufacturers um, on the Right Skills Now, which is part of our Skills for America. And we are teaching um, entrepreneurial skills as well as uh, manufacturing skills. This was CNC machines, precision manufacturing. And the community college folks were saying um, that they're having trouble recruiting. And the reason they're having trouble recruiting is that they go home and the mom says, uh, you know, I want my kid to do um, computers. And we were standing in the middle of the manufacturing floor and the operator said, I am running a computer. I'm running a computer that happens to be attached to a machine. But this is a computer job. It's not, you know, the same kind of manufacturing as before. And we have a, we have a lot of work to do, <clears throat> I think, to change that um, fear that uh, you'll go into a skill and there won't be a job there. And this effort and uh, this moment and all of you who are telling your stories uh, and conveying the message have a lot to do with helping our youth and our next generation get in a pathway that successfully takes them to a good paying job that's going to stay here. And that's something that this administration has a lot of uh, engagement with, a lot of program around, and uh, we're highly committed and, and succeeding, I think, in, in building the foundation to do that. I've been promoting an idea that, that ties together the, the need for financing and the need for more skilled workforce and the SBA. Oh, <laughs> so uh, the idea would be that for companies that can't get uh, loans conventionally, let's say they're not an ABC credit, they're a D credit. They're not an F, but maybe a D. And if the SBA guarantees the loan for every let's say $250,000 or $500,000 worth of loan that is guaranteed, they have to have one uh, registered apprentice. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can't, you can't get the money on your own. Well, if, if we're gonna guarantee it for you, you have to contribute something to society by training the people that will help you or help some other com company in the future. Well, yeah. I think that's a great, that's a great idea and uh, t does tie together specifically um, a lot of the things I think we've heard from folks here and, and uh, or, uh, labor this morning who are very committed to apprenticeship as well, Department of Labor that has a good uh, apprenticeship program where we yeah. do have capital available, uh, grants available. I'm going to turn to the audience um, for a whole set of questions, so think about that. And then I'm going to also turn back to the panel. I have a few more questions for them. Yes. Another call center. Yes. Administrative emails. Just such a tremendous story to have been part of the 2009 Jobs Forum and have yes. seen you firsthand take all of the suggestions that came out of our session into action and create the results that you Say your name and where I'm, I'm Angie Selden and I'm the uh, chairman of Arise Virtual Solutions. So I just want to applaud you for the great uh, progress. Angie that gave us a long laundry list at that 2009 time of things we need to get done. Yeah. <laughs> so it's what's on your... That. Right? So, um, so I think one of the things that um, I'm delighted to hear in this panel is a focus on the service industry. Um, much of the, of the discussion today has really been focused on manufacturing jobs. And uh, we, we do know, though, that 80% of employment today in the United States is a service sector um, focused role. And so a couple of things to consider. Uh, the first is, uh, as we are focused on trying to build skills, there's a suggestion about connecting to community colleges, but I'd like to suggest that we take half of the 280,000 identified teachers who were um, identified as not employed uh, in the Jobs Act and suggest that they be skilled up to be able to learn how to teach people jobs skills. And in the service sector, for example, if we could take and teach those folks how to 
deliver those job skills in a virtual manner, what we are able to do then is educate people without any constraint around a bricks and mortar facility because we allow people to connect from their computer at home and be able to uh, skill themselves up to be able to perform these, uh, these new service oriented jobs. Well, it's a great idea and one of the things that I know that you do and some others do, um, you have a lot of home based call centers right, yes. people. Uh, today so it's have, another way right, to... Thank you. Yes, we have 22,000 folks today in the United States who actually do uh, back office and call center work from home. And that number, since we had the opportunity to be together in 2009, has doubled. So we were 11,000 when we last saw you, and we're now 22,000. And we expect another 8,000 workers in the United States alone in 2012. And so um, the second idea then is really to be focused um, first, like we talked about, first on skills, but then second on the work. And so I'd like to encourage the Small Business Administration as well as the government at large to look at work that's being done today that has a belief that it has to be done in a bricks and mortar facility. Because what we're finding the progressive companies, um, many of the Fortune 500 companies today are doing, is that they're looking at um, ways in which work can be virtualized so that the work can be placed with a worker as opposed to making workers have to actually commute or relocate to a community in order to be able to find the job. We know what the housing market challenges today. It's very difficult for people to decide to relocate. So virtualization of work allows us to actually move the, the job or the work that's being done to where the worker actually resides and allows them to do it in a very green oriented manner by being able to perform that work from home. So that would be the second suggestion I would make is let's look for ways to take work that people consider has to be done in a bricks and mortar center today and let's figure out how to virtualize that work and send it home. I'm glad you mentioned that part of the business case in, in bringing them home back to the United States and being able to do it at 15% cheaper is the work at home model. And I know for businesses it's about 30% cheaper, but for the employee, for the employee, they actually see a pay, in sort of a pay raise to their cost base of si at least 6% or $6,000, maybe 8,000 if you think it's not being taxed. With so, with all the cost savings associated with yeah. right. no longer having to commute, not having to outfit yourself with a professional wardrobe, et cetera, really um, puts more money in the pockets of American workers. And so we had over 100,000 people express interest last year in uh, being able to work from home. And this is one of the things that we see over and over in when we look at entrepreneurs here, which is you can reinvent uh, the way work is done and how we do it here because technology will allow you to connect everybody securely in the home, for instance. So we can, you know, we can continually look for new opportunities. Yes, the gentleman there. Um, my name is Lonnie Kane. I'm a man apparel manufacturer from Los Angeles, California. Um, and yes, we still make clothing in the United States. Um, we don't sell it to Walmart, but the part, better department store is enough. And that business, those jobs are coming back. Um, like we've heard earlier, there are issues in China. There's raising prices. Um, there's a drop in quality. We found over a year ago that we were having more and more difficulties with the products we were bringing out of China um, and looked into We've, we've maintained some production in the United States, and we looked at how we could do more. One of the issues facing us, there's a number of issues facing us, but one of the issues, um, one, vocational training is horrible in California. Um, the State Board of Education um, curriculum is that every child who does graduate, not many do graduate in California from a high school, will be trained to go on to a four-year education, not to become a plumber and not to become an electrician. Um, so we need bad education. We need to deal with the in, in a realistic way with immigration. We have, we are, are, we have, as a country, have looked past immigration as an issue. And until we deal with that, we have a workforce in California, predominantly Latino, okay, predominantly illegal. They're, they are going to feed their families some way. They are working, mostly illegally. You know. But companies like American Apparel Company, which is a very large regional uh, t-shirt company, 
was raided. They lost 5,000 jobs in the city of Los Angeles through a raid. Um, there's food companies um, throughout this country that are being raided on a regular basis by ICE that are losing thousands of jobs. They cannot find a replacement people to put back in there. We need to be realistic. We need a work visa program that is manageable and realistic for the problems we face. Well, thank you, and I think you probably are following some of the uh, immigration discussions uh, that the president has put forth, um, some proposals on that. And I think there's a lot of agreement um, that these are issues that we need to get solved. Yes. Can you stand up and everybody can see you in here? I'm here at uh, Our company has been manufacturing products in the U.S. We have the largest sleeping bag factory in this country. And we've been bringing jobs back to this country. We've been expanding at our plant in Haleyville, Alabama. And one of the big issues that we have is being competitive in the global market is materials that we can't get in the U.S. that we're having to import, we're competing with other countries working in free trade zones. It's, I know that with go to the furniture, I don't know if you still bring in some of your raw materials that you can yeah. Yeah. get in the U.S. Yeah. How could we bring our costs down to compete against international companies that are working in free trade? You could so probably used to, you used to be able to buy those things, but they all went to China. I have the same problem with hardware, decorative hardware, and, and, uh, and uh, even uh, drawer glides that uh, I can't get in the United States. Well, there are some made in the United States, but they're very, very expensive. Same with decorative hardware. It's very, I mean, it used to be literally dozens of decorative hardware manufacturers in the United States, and now there's none. So that's a good point. Right. And um, Dara, did you want to no. say something to that? Yeah, so um, we have some ideas about uh, helping you with, with some of this sourcing, and also um, if you wanted to produce any of that in house, how you might, you know, get some, some of the financing to do that. One of the things that uh, you wanted to mention, though, Bruce, was um, the level playing field. Did you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, you know, there, there is a level playing field now. I, I feel like that we can definitely compete uh, with the Chinese and with the other Asian <laughs> countries. And um, it's going to be interesting to see those people that will um, also take these these initiatives and manufacture furniture again and other pr consumer products in the United States. Uh, w one thing that hasn't been mentioned today is that uh, the furniture industry in China was heavily subsidized to, and they always had export initiatives to, to sell products in China, and the Chinese businessmen got very wealthy with it. Uh, those, those export uh, generous subsidies uh, in China have all but disappeared, but now they're now they're incentivizing these same factories to uh, sell products domestically. So you're getting export uh, subsidies that used to be for export. Now there's subsidies for domestic sales, and that'll really really impact uh, not only furniture but all consumer products in the United in here. We'll be selling furniture to China. There's no question about it. They love. They love, Asians love American-made products, and there's a real appetite for it. Cost is not an issue. So I say made in America is hot. How many of you have sort of gotten that sense? Yeah. This yeah is, made in America been... means uh, a better America, Yeah. for sure. I'm James Curley, and I'm the CEO of Keen Footwear of Portland, Oregon. And it's interesting. I've had a fascinating day watching the different journeys of, of different companies. and. We find ourselves now in a place, and I, I can kind of speak on behalf of the outdoor industry as well, where, um, you know, certainly for our company, we've got through our working capital situation, we've got our innovation platform, we've built a factory in, uh, in uh, Portland, Oregon, we launched a new category for steel toe footwear outside of outdoor to sort of expand and grow and innovate, and uh, last year we had 95 people, we went, we went past the 100 person mark for the company, we went from 95 to 132. But the challenge we have now is not so much around the dynamics that we're hearing about today. <coughs> when I look to the future, um, you say made in America, we're, we're building product in America. Um, how do you protect that? 
how the outdoor industry, because we have brands that are appealing around the world, brands like the North Face, who are the, you know, in, in our terms, they're the big guys, and then uh, right down to some very specialized brands. And the notion of protecting not only innovation, intellectual property, and quite frankly, just the counterfeiting dynamic is, uh, is, is rampant. And uh, it is not just product for product, making an item look like ours and selling it. There's the digital platform that gets set up quickly. The product gets to the market quickly, faster than ever, by the way. And our ability, you know, the obstacle course, or call it the opportunity course we're on, just when we figure one thing out, we look ahead and we say, gosh, we got hit with this. And it'd be interesting to see what the Small Business Administration can do once you've built this. Let's assume in 10 years we're wildly successful. How, how do we protect that platform so that there's a cost to innovation? And the challenge here, I heard you this morning, and I, the software you've created, does it take into consideration the mid and long term cost of innovation and that innovation evaporating? Because if it does, we need to, we need to deal with that. Yeah, do you want to talk? So one of the, uh, we, we, how many of you have heard that we're supposed to be an innovation country? Mm -hmm. Innovation country, yeah? And, and almost the implication is that we should, we should innovate, you know, be sort of like Apple. We innovate and then forget about manufacturing. And in, in Apple's case, uh, uh, tr I think 25,000 employees are in the U.S. and something like a half a million to three quarters are in China actually making the things and shipping them all over the world. So Ap Apple has a trade deficit, so to speak. So, so, so if you want to innovate, it, in Apple's case, it's worked, but in general, it doesn't work well when you separate engineering from manufacturing. In re repeated studies by uh, Pisano and she at Harvard Business School, Michael Porter at Harvard Business School, have shown when you, if you get, uh, if, if this is how you used to be with engineering and manufacturing together and you let the manufacturing come over here, the effectiveness of communication, the effectiveness of collaboration drops off dramatically. And we've seen that with uh, cases where, where it's been brought back by GE, by uh, NCR, by others, bringing it back, putting them together, the innovation works. Now, because if you let the manufacturing go over here and if you, if you don't bring it back, pretty soon the logical solution is that your engineering goes over there too, to get it back together to get that efficiency. And now you have neither of them, and now you essentially have nothing. So we think it's, it's absolutely essential to keep, to, to, to be an innovation country, we have to be a manufacturing country. Well, I will say that this is a big part of the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership, um, which is universities, uh, some corporate leaders, and the administration working together on keeping manufacturing, um, doing advanced manufacturing, and keeping the pilot stage of that. Um, right after innovation, when you start to scale up, keeping that here, because it's really in that first scale-up stage that a lot of the innovation uh, gets well understood and codified. And if you're doing that somewhere else, then the final production will be there. But if that manufacturing process expertise happens here, then it's a foundation for the next set of jobs here. So we're, we're very focused. I think we can take a couple more questions in the back. Uh, yes, my name is Bill Robichaud. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Collaborative Consulting. We recently opened up a, um, a domestic development center in Warsaw, Wisconsin. And by the way, I, I vacation in Maine all summer. Um, my question, uh, well, we're trying to bring technology jobs that have been going to India and to China back to the United States. And, and so my question is to you, Harry, uh, you stated that um, that you believe a 20, 20 to 30 percent hidden cost in manufacturing by having jobs overseas. Do you also feel that same 20 to 30 percent hidden cost is in in services and IT services as well? I think it's a lot more difficult to measure and, and more more functionally dependent. In, in manufacturing, it, it's easy to measure the the duty and the freight and the carrying cost of the inventory and the the all these things. So so, so this is just a series of things that are, are relatively easy to 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 measure. Whereas with uh, with services, it's it's a, a greater question about the relative productivity of the two. Uh, there's still travel cost to go check on them. There's still intellectual property risk. There's but it's. Uh, um, I mean, I, I, I would, on that, uh, on the subject of services in general, I would uh, give way to the experts here who have noted that, uh, that it's about 
equivalently costly offshore and domestically, and domestically the quality is higher and the customer satisfaction is higher. I'd be glad to, I'd be glad to meet with you after and, and start working on that project if you'd like, uh, like me to find a better solution. As a former CIO, I will tell you, it's exactly the same, different metrics, exactly the same issues. Commun the communication issues about, about what we wanted and the arguing back and forth about the product and what we meant by, it's, it's, it was even more amazing in IT to, to me when I ran a, the, a major IT operation. So I think it's very, very similar. We've, um, we've met with great success. We've taken on two projects recently that we've taken two two sets of jobs that were going to India, and we were able to take them to the United States and, and house them in Wausau, Wisconsin. So we're very often In Waukesha? Yeah. In Wausau. Oh, Wausau. Well, I, one of the things I really encourage people is, if you're offshore right now, go ahead and do the same activity, be it a call center or whatever, onshore, so that you can take a look at the productivity lines of code or whatever it is, the output, and you can really make a comparison. When you've shipped everything over there, it's really hard to tell. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. My name is Shane Mays. I'm with the Onshore Technology Services. We're a rural IT outsourcing firm, so we do um, software development and data services and stuff like that, and we um, <clears throat> compete for work that goes offshore. Actually, um, I, if, if it's the same collaborative consulting, we've worked together. And, uh, we haven't met in person, but they're a customer. <laughs> um, That's good. We like it when business gets done here, you know? I have an idea, and it's really, uh, it's a dream. Um, we, so the, the problem that we've solved at Onshore is we figured out how to retool underemployed, dislocated workers and put them into advanced software development jobs just by extremely focused boot camps and training. Um, in rural America, there's like 60 million people and they've pretty much been overshot by the uh, IT economy and all of its advances. Why can't we, I mean, when I see Angie's 22,000 jobs, and Mary, I applaud what you're doing, couldn't we just really get together and say, you know, so there's three million people, uh, there's three million jobs that can't be filled right now. There's 14 million people not working. So just with, targeted efforts and us just getting together and being aggressive in how we give those people those skills. Couldn't we just say, I mean, even with the people in this room, hey, let's create a million jobs and well, then just do it? This is, uh, I, I think what you're saying is exactly what uh, the president has said in this administration has said, and the nuts and bolts of that um, are, you know, part of what you see happening around you, part of the pieces that come out to do that is we have to have our small and large businesses, our supply chains, um, connected to our training programs, our improvements in education. And that's one of the things I have to say, um, I hope you take away from today, which is, um, Bruce, when you said this to me, when you actually come here and you see what's happening, there's a lot of talk about what doesn't go right in Washington, but on the other side, we're taking a lot of program that's out there and focusing it. Now is the time that we have to be very efficient on doing what you said, which is whether it's workforce training, we have to make a better match between the skills that we train for and what the businesses need. And one of the ways we're doing it, I'm very proud to say, is that small business has a much larger voice. We're, we're listening, we're finding ways to get what small businesses need um, and making those connections. And part of it, it's a retail operation. It's happening in clusters, it's happening with our mayors, it's happening but, uh, with linkages between folks like the um, Department of Agriculture that uh, operates in rural America and our forces, our small business groups. So we are, uh, and if you see ways in your communities that we can be um, of more help, that we can facilitate the activity of your business um, to find more capital, find more trained workers, connect, get permitted better. We are committed to being on the ground, whether it's uh, the um, Select USA operation, whether it's our on the ground operations that we have. We have 900 uh, small business development centers 
So there's one probably within 45 minutes of your business. And if you're thinking about issues that you have in growing your business, we want to make sure whatever door you open in the federal government, you can navigate your way to a solution that is helpful to you. That's how we need to make government work in the 21st century. It has to be seamless to you whether you're navigating from SBA uh, or the Labor Department. We need to make sure the solution is finding its way to you. So with that pitch, I will tell you um, uh, we launched, we, the President announced a while ago, a website for small businesses, um, and there's the SBA.gov. Those are places that you can come and uh, put in what it is that you're looking for, and we can find more and more effective ways of connecting you to those federal resources. Now, do we have a closing chat on? Hmm? I will take one more question and just um, want to make sure. I, we'd hope Nancy and DePaul, who's fabulous, will be here. Um, I'll, I'll take one more question, and uh, but before that, I really want to say the president said to um, uh, Gene Sperling coming over and said to me walking back over there that the discussions that he has had with all of you, the things he has heard from all of you, you're going to be hearing that back because he um, really appreciated uh, understanding where you are in bringing your business back to this country, what it will take for you to do it, and how we can be your partner. Yes, the last question. Hi, uh, I'm Ron here. I teach uh, at Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York. It's been a, a great meeting and lots of inspirational stories here. I wonder that the academic side of me uh, wonders to what extent this is, uh, we're measuring what's going on. Uh, certainly, you know, on the good side, we look at trade deficits and things like that. Are there any efforts by the administration to start to, to measure this, both at the sort of macro level, but also these individual case studies? And Har Harry's work, of course, has been uh, I instrumental. I answer that a bit. We, we have a, a We have good partners, too. <laughs> we have a library that uh, accumulates all of the articles, all the published cases about reshoring about work that's actually come back. And it's, uh, right now it has about 100 articles in it. In a couple of months it'll have 300 when it gets up to date. And it'll be searchable, sortable, et cetera. So, so we, we encourage, first we encourage any of the media that's left to write lots of reshoring articles to, to push the trend. And we can help you find the cases. And then second, anyone who comes across the cases for your company or otherwise to send them to me, we get them all into that database. And then when, when I've searched it in the past, searched that and searched the, the, uh, the web, you find the reported cases of reshoring doing this. Now, it isn't absolute proof. It could be they're just being reported better. But, but there's, there's enough of it happening and enough, enough of the contract manufacturers that I talk to who say they're doing dramatically more of it today than they were a couple of years ago. So it's still somewhat anecdotal, but our library would be the, the best uh, quantification that I know of. On contact centers, I brought some copies of my white paper on some of the metrics that I use around customer satisfaction and cost and things like that. You're welcome to that or get it on my website, number one.com. So we'll, just well I want to thank the panel, um, and I want to thank all of you for coming and spending the time. Uh, Christine Cornitas and the NEC and all of you who uh, helped pull this together. Well, I think we have Greg, for some last words? All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, everybody. Well, we have um, one final speaker who just wanted to get a chance to come over and say thanks. Um, and uh, uh, it's my pleasure to get the chance to introduce her. Introduce her. Now that I work in the, the White House and the government, I get the chance to see um, how a lot of uh, things work on the policy side. And, and uh, the next speaker you're about to hear from is the person who makes things happen for us on policy, makes sure that uh, all of our um, uh, policies actually focus specifically on the folks that's intended to help small businesses have been a big part of, uh, of our work and of her portfolio. So with that, I want to introduce uh, Nancy Endeparl, who's our Deputy Chief of Staff for Policy. I just want to thank again all the business leaders, advocates, and officials who shared with us today and with the President and Vice President uh, your stories about bringing jobs back to America. Uh, the President and the Vice President noted that America is the best place in the world to do business and create jobs. And after hearing from all of you all today, I think we can agree. 
Throughout the day, we've heard that the economics are, are clear, that locating in the U.S. makes sense for companies that are both manufacturing and providing services. The U.S. has added over 300,000 manufacturing jobs in the past two years, and we've improved our competitiveness. The businesses that we heard from today are making the choice to start, invest, and grow in the United States, creating jobs here at home because it makes sense for their bottom lines, from large businesses like Ford to international businesses like Siemens, from manufacturers like Masterlock to small businesses like Lincolnton Furniture in North Carolina, which is adding 130 new jobs and restarting operations at a once vacant plant. These companies are bringing jobs back because locating here offers a competitive cost structure, the ability to provide better consumer service and to respond more quickly to their customer needs. At the same time, we've heard from all of you all that nothing competes with made in America quality and reliability. And as the President and the Vice President mentioned today, we're calling on other companies to follow their lead, to follow your lead and to bring jobs back and invest in America. The President asked you today and asked all companies to do whatever they can to look for every opportunity to bring jobs back here. We can, from the federal government's perspective, and do more uh, and should do more to accelerate the insourcing trends that we've heard about today. And one of the reasons we wanted you all to come here is so that you could give us more ideas about what we could do to make it easier for you to bring jobs back, to locate your uh, businesses and the expansion of your businesses here in the United States. Over the past three years, the President has put forward and implemented policies like tax breaks, research and development credits, and the recently signed trade agreements that several of you noted uh, have helped to ensure that your businesses can compete. Today, we announced some new initiatives, including new tax proposals to reward companies that choose to invest or bring back jobs to the U.S. A proposed expansion to the recently launched Select USA program that helps build federal, state, and local partnerships to attract investment to the U.S. Increasing support for states' efforts to promote investment through federal officials and export assistance centers in more than 100 cities. We've heard today that perhaps our greatest asset is our skilled and productive workforce, and we heard that over and over again about how much more productive our workers are and how much uh, more they've gotten even over the last couple of years. We will continue to develop partnerships between labor, education, and businesses to help ensure that America's workforce is ready to respond to the needs of the future. In addition to the great programs highlighted by companies here today, we're working with Skills for America's Future and the President's Jobs Council to ensure that workforce and skills training remains a key element of our economic strategy. Most of all, though, we thank you for taking your time to come here today because we need to continue to partner with all of you. As many have said, one of the biggest barriers to insourcing is a lack of awareness about the potential economic advantages of the U.S. So we hope that today we've helped to uh, shine a bright light on the pot potential economic advantages of doing business right here in the U.S. and that you will go out and continue to be ambassadors for that. By working together, we can address this lack of awareness, and we look forward to getting it done with the White House as your partner. Thank you very much.